Okay, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Contact and Conscious Evolution Synergy Circle. Thank you all for joining us. And for those of you that are here for the first time, I see we have a few people um, that haven't been with us before. The purpose of this Synergy Circle is to support and accelerate the conscious evolution of humanity and expansion of human awareness through increasing our individual and collective readiness for overt ongoing contact with other intelligences in our cosmic family. And today we have a very special guest, evolution <laughs> biologist and author and futurist, our beloved Dr. Elizabeth Satoris, who will be sharing with us some insights on cosmic guidance for human evolution, which humanity and our world at large so desperately needs right now. And after Elizabeth's sharing, we'll have an opportunity to have a really juicy dialogue together facilitated by Alan Seinfeld around this topic. Um, so if you want to learn more about this Synergy Circle, again, if you're here for the first time and wish to participate in future gatherings, please just leave your name and email in the chat so we can be in touch with you. And if uh, anybody's not speaking, if you can just mute yourself because we're getting some feedback. Yes. Let me see where that's coming. Okay. There we go. So just one part of our mission as a circle is to explore our cosmic evolutionary consciousness and um, innate human abilities through individual and collective practices and sharing them with others so that we could more easily receive and send information from the greater consciousness fields. And each time we meet as a circle, we have one or more members of the circle guide us in a collective practice. So if any of you uh, would like to offer a practice for a future gathering, please let us know. You can just also put that in the chat. And um, for our opening practice today, we're so grateful that Jeff Vanderkluth, who has been gifted with an intuitive capacity to calibrate resonance, consciousness, and truth of possibilities will be guiding us today. So Jeff, I'd like to turn it over to you. Thank you, Diane, and thanks everyone for being here. I'd like to invite us to relax and become open. And you may wish to close your eyes. This will be a different kind of meditation, just under three minutes. There are four tone sequences that are designed and indeed they've been intuitively received and they support our capacities for contact. Just so you have some awareness of what these sequences are working on. The first supports openness to contact. And the second is a request, requesting contact. So we're asking. The third is an activation of our telepathy. And the fourth supports mastery of non-local consciousness. And the sequences will repeat three times. They're not music in the sense that we're used to. And I hope you'll enjoy them anyway. So here we go.
Thank you very much for your openness and your availability to contact. Back to you, Diane. Thank you so much, Jeff. It's really beautiful. So I'd like to turn things over to Alan Seinfeld, who will be introducing Elizabeth and then facilitating the next portion of our program. Hmm. Thanks, Diane. It's great to see everyone here because this subject, cosmic cultures, is seems to be accelerating, seems to be more in the news, more people are interested, it's no longer ridiculed. And someone like Elizabeth has been involved in this study for decades, really. And, and, and she's also been a regular on my ET roundtable, which is every Wednesday night. And I've gotten to know her a little bit and honored to introduce her because of the scope of her investigations and knowledge. And um, one of my favorite things that she says in, in these meetings sometimes is that you have to play the whole keyboard. You know, we can't just look into space hoping for salvation or, or to be saved or, or to leave this, this great planet that we're here in these bodies are about being incarnate and reaching for the stars. That's my interpretation of what the whole keyboard's about. And, and maybe she'll touch on that, but I just wanna read something um, from a, a book uh, and a meeting that she was part of when Cosmic Cultures Meet. It was one of the first earliest UFO ET type gatherings that Dr. JJ Hurtock was there, John Mack, Charles Tart. There were a lot of very well-known people there. And um, Elizabeth comment, writes an article or presents a paper, and now it's a book, When Cosmic Cultures Meet. Um, actually, I'll just do a brief introduction um, about who she is. She, uh, an American Greek geobiologist, futurist, and author of Gaia, The Human Journey from Chaos to Cosmos. She's also the co-founder of the Worldwide Indigenous Science Network and a consultant to indigenous peoples for the United Nations and, and, and Geneva. And, you know, she's an evolutionary biologist, but she also has this whole understanding of indigenous culture. So that is part of playing the whole keyboard, <laughs> I think. So she says um, here, experiences and reports of other dimensional and other planetary encounters here on earth are still strange to most people. So strange in fact that many, if not most people in industrial cultures do not believe they occur. But this failure of belief is in turn strange to cultures outside our Western scientific industrial paradigm to whom other dimensions are as familiar as our basic understanding of, of space and time, the four dimensions that we, we understand. So what she does in this whole talk in, in for cosmic cultures is show how the universe is composed of 10 or more cultures, which is apparent to most people around the planet, except those brought up in this very limited scientific view. So basically, this whole keyboard approach is to know we're part of a bigger cosmos. And this has been, I feel, part of Elizabeth's mission to the earth to deliver the scope of what it's possible for human beings to be and understand. So Elizabeth, thanks so much for being here and joining us. Thank you, Alan. Um, you should all know that he's given both my bio and the quote from 1995, <laughs> just what, over 25 years ago now. <laughs> You've done a lot more, I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of fun. I, I don't remember when I've been introduced from so far back and it's a fun to remember. And I actually am really going to go back to that conference. Uh, because uh, my topic today is cosmic guidance for human evolution. And so much has been uncovered or speculated about ET roles in our past. Uh, you know, we've got our Greg Braden's and our JJ Hurtak's and, and so forth that, uh, that I want to focus on the present and the future of humanity. 
And uh, I do want to refocus on that first disclosure conference. There were three disclosure conferences in Washington, DC. Most people know about the second and third, both of which were kind of organized uh, by our, our attorney friend, um, Alan, help me out. <laughs> uh, Steve, Steve Bassett, was it? You're talking I said, Steve, who are you talking about? Steve Bassett? The no, no, the, the lawyer. Oh, Danny uh, Sheehan. Danny, Danny, Danny Sheehan. Sheehan. Danny Sheehan. Danny Sheehan. Sorry yeah. about that. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> it's early in the morning. Um, okay. At, at the time of that disclosure conference, which was the first one in 1995, I was living in the Peruvian Andes. I'd gone up there to study Andean science after hearing a lecture in Washington, DC, where I'd been based after coming back from Greece, 13 years in Greece, <laughs> uh, where I'd written the first Gaia book you mentioned. Um, and so I was up there in the Andes and uh, met a young man named, uh, whom I, got to call himself Puma because he'd given the kind of silly sounding birth name of Freddie uh, when he was born up there. The Andeans have a way of, of naming their indigenous kids after uh, George Washington and all kinds of people. I, I'm not sure who Freddie was, but Puma was one of the names of his grandfather teacher and that seemed more appropriate. And many of you probably know that Puma is now one of uh, the stars in Stephen Dynan's ever-growing empire of, of speakers and teachers, and was also featured in the PBS series on Native Americans. Uh, so he's come a long way since when I met him at age 14 and brought him up to Washington, DC, his first time out of the mountains, uh, and already well into his 21 years of training by his grandfather teacher, uh, from age three to 24, he was trained. He would have to stand in icy thunderstorms on mountainsides, moving souls from darkness to light and learning to set bones and deliver babies and you know just everything in the fields of medicine and philosophy and religion and and I called him a medicine priest on the advice of other indigenous friends of mine who did not like the word shaman to be associated with people in the Americas, since that was a name, a, a culture from uh, far off in Asia. Anyway, um, so one of the important things that Puma said when he spoke at that conference was, why in school are we never are we only taught the history of war and never the history of love? And it really dropped everyone's jaws <laughs> because he had learned both. He was learning the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and all that warfare stuff in school. And then his grandfather would teach him the history of love at home. We also had at that conference, Paula Underwood, a dear friend, uh, another indigenous person who in the last part of her life uh, was on the staff at IONS. And uh, Paula taught the rule of six, that whenever you're trying to explain anything, you should always have to think up six plausible explanations for it. And I think of that often these days during this COVID crisis, that there are so many stories out there. And can we all think up six plausible uh, ways of explaining it? And then we had, of course, JJ was there and he may remember that uh, Puma borrowed his bathing suit to go swimming. <laughs> and, um, and we have uh, JJ with us who can say his little bits later. And Zechariah Sitchin, Charles Tart, all these wonderful people. And um, I, who was it? Charles Tart, I think said that we weren't enlightened enough yet to commune with in, with ETs, <laughs> which was an interesting comment. And then uh, my evolution biology, of course, is primarily about a maturation cycle that runs through evolution in which we move from the expansive juvenile uh, creative and often very hostile phase, eventually getting it that it's cheaper to feed your enemies than to kill them and moving into a cooperative stage stopping the expansion economy just as our cells stop 
duplicating, uh, you know, dividing to make us bigger after adolescence when we have to stay the same size the rest of our lives, except in my age when you're shrinking again. Um, so uh, currently I see us all in the chrysalis. You all know the better butterfly metaphor I got from Nori Heddle huddle and have been expanding as did Barbara Marx Hubbard uh, ever since then as a metaphor for current human evolution that we are moving from the predatory, exploitative, hostile, chomping caterpillar stage to the butterfly uh, stage of living lighter on the earth and more sustainably. So the keyboard idea, and we of course now evolutionarily are in that chrysalis uh, trying to build a butterfly while the caterpillar is gasping its last. And especially around the era of empire that's been going on for about 6,000 years from empires ruled by emperors to those national empires and now corporate empires. And you know we're trying to, to get past the end of it even though it's very alive and well right now. So um, I wanted to Oh, the keyboard that uh, Alan introduced me by is that I've, I've had these different symposia on figuring out what the basic stories of different sciences in the world are with a view to building a consortium of sciences that can kind of checks and balance where a science of a living universe such as Islam has uh, can say to a science like Western materialist science, no, you can't toxify your environment, you know, da, da, da. Um, and then, the, of course, the Vedic science came into our world through the paradigm shift when the um, uh, scientists started going all the way down through matter and coming out into consciousness and then had no way of explaining that in the worldview they were taught. So they had to turn to Vedic science as all the fathers, founding fathers of quantum theory did uh, to explain their own findings. So we have consciousness rooted sciences and we have living system sciences and we have mechanistic materialist sciences and we need to bring that consortium together the way the religions have done. Now, what all the scientists seem to agree on is that the universe is made of vibrations. And that's what I mean by the keyboard. If you think of the universe and yourself uh, as a keyboard running from matter in the low keys and then uh, electromagnetic energy in the mid range. And when Western science which starts at that low key end of the keyboard to derive the whole universe, then Einstein showed us that matter is energy and energy is matter, right? EMC squared. But Western science gets stuck. It can't go further up the keyboard because it says that to be real, something has to be measurable with physical instruments. And the physical instruments can't measure the part where it goes into mind and spirit and you know pure consciousness. Those people who looked at the universe from the other end of the keyboard who start in the consciousness end can derive the whole thing just by slowing it down. So the Taoists have this sequence of matter, energy, spirit, and so do the Vedics and, and uh, a lot of the sciences in the world. So I wanted to spend the rest of my time in a tribute to John Mack, who was there at that conference, and just read a couple of quotes for him. But then I realized that I, I had a little bit more to say, so I'm gonna read fewer quotes than I had intended of John Mack's. But John was talking about, I'd like to turn now to what appears to be the basic pattern and meaning of the abduction phenomenon. First abductees are being told over and over that this phenomenon is occurring in the context of the threat to earth as a living system, a response to the ecological devastation that our particular species has undertaken. As one of the abductees I worked with put it, the phenomenon is an effort to bring about a cosmic correction for Earth. Evident, for Earth evidently has a place in the larger fabric of meaning and significance in the cosmos. And this one species cannot be allowed to destroy it for its own exploitative purposes. Second, this other intelligence appears to function as a kind of intermediary between the source of creation and us emissaries perhaps of that correction. 
This does not mean that every kind of alien being is involved in that mission, but the beings are often perceived in this way. And then moving to the end of his talk and his conclusions, he said he speaks of the Dalai Lama when a group of researchers met with him, and that's where I first met John Mack was was at one of the meetings with the Dalai Lama. Um, uh, around the alien abduction phenomenon in 1992 suggested that, here's, this is the Dalai Lama quote, these beings, these creatures, they are very upset. We are destroying their physical and spiritual homes. They have no choice, he said, but to become physical and kind of come back and try to stop us. And John goes on saying, our job at this time for all of us appears to be to overcome the dualism, the separateness, that has characterized not only our worldview, but our scientific approaches to all the realms that have been studied up to this point. The task now is to integrate the polarities at every level. At the intrapsychic level, this means the darkness within us as well as our loving spiritual selves. At the interpersonal level, we have to overcome the polarized individual and collective human relationships that find expression for example, in the extreme polarization within the human community. So, um, so much for John Mack. Now I want to go back again to talk about uh, my part in that conference in which I spoke about the Andeans calling ETs the light people. And up there in Peru, um, where I was studying Andean science, it's agriculture, it's astronomy, all of those things. Uh, they took it for granted that these pe beings who came in, in flying ships and Puma saw one of those ships under the ice, the lights of it all flashing under the ice when he was doing his sacred uh, walks up onto the, the very dangerous glaciers to bring ice back to the community. It was a, it's a ritual they do. And anyway, people called them uh, healers and teachers because they seemed to be able to heal people and they fixed broken trucks and they taught them how to do new things. And so they lived in harmony with these ETs. And it's very interesting that our culture has to wrestle with the idea of how are we gonna deal with them when they come? Well, it's no wonder they landed and hung out up there in places like the Andes where nobody brought out guns when they landed. Uh, you know, and we're very interested in, in these newcomers, the way so many Native Americans, uh, you know, welcomed the Europeans who came over, not knowing what damage they would do. So uh, there's a book uh, that I quote called Genesis of the Andean Culture at the end of my talk, in which the, the, they, the Native people of the Andes, in this case, the Aymara, talk about the, the Western culture, the man who finds himself where the sun hides itself, uh, being like a tangled ball of yarn, unable to think straight because they had separated men, women, children, old people into individuals and egos and no longer knew how to form community. So I think it's very interesting yeah. that we have so many and indigenous people who matured through that childhood into the caring and sharing community, even the first and the only true democracy I think ever on earth was not in Greece and not from our founding fathers, but from the Haudenosaunee on whose territory I was born in the Hudson Valley, we call them the Iroquois. They had a true democracy. Ben Franklin knew it well and tried to get the founding fathers to copy it but all they ever copied was the tripartite division of government for checks and balances left out women, children, nature, and the future. They didn't, we don't think seven generations ahead. So uh, enough of that. Uh, we need to learn now, how can we interact with, with alien, I don't like that word, with, with extraterrestrials and intraterrestrials in such a ways that we can hear them in saying, do not destroy your planet. Right. You know, only from human physical bodies can we play the entire keyboard. 
the angels are lined up, they say, for human bodies because they want the experiences of this rich emotional dark light dualities reconciliation thing that we face in our world. So I think of these things a lot during this COVID crisis when the dualities are so strong that even people like ourselves, evolutionary leaders can take sides and feel antagonistic toward each other. It's, it's, it's unthinkable. We cannot go in that direction. So I turn it over to anyone who has questions or wants to make if, if anyone has a question, but let me just hear from uh, Dr. JJ Hurtock first, because he was at that conference, which was really a ground setting conference for how we would start to question these other levels of reality. Dr. Hurtock, do you want to comment? Well, first of all, Desiree and I would like to congratulate our wonderful <laughs> sister, what you just said is so meaningful to us because we also work with the indigenous in Africa and in Brazil where our NGOs are located. Uh, at that conference, which was a historic moment, an open door, I had an opportunity to show documentation with Dr. John Mack of our work with the Zulus and some of the other ethnic groups in Southern Africa, particularly those who have seen the aliens slash the cosmic others face to face. And we're not alarmed, we're, we're enriched by the vibration and the sense of dignity that was conveyed, particularly children that were uh, in various parts of Southern Africa, uh, Zimbabwe, uh, Namibia, Lesotho, all of the work that we were connected with was based upon a tonal uh, language. Because as many of you may not know, the uh, Examination of the ET specimen showed that many of them didn't have uh, vocal cords as we have. Uh, they had a, a thin membrane around their mouths and their vocal system or their, their throat goes back only four inches since they tend to communicate through uh, sound signals and telepathic uh, language. And so we had the opportunity to show four distinct categories, which is in the proceedings of that remarkable first disclosure conference. Uh, of course, everything was debated. I'm showing up a picture right now from one of our small monographs. It's probably hard to see for most of you. But since that time, uh, we've been working with Russian and uh, German and Italian uh, scientists who have actually seen the specimens in Peru that Elizabeth just referred to. We have models. We've actually made a film of the bodies themselves, although this has been in, shall we say, a, a sensitive area uh, of, of classification. But this documentation will be coming out this year and uh, next year this time, we'll probably know at least eight of the some 82 categories that MUFON in the United States has categorized. Right, so we were just with Konstantin Karakov. Some of you probably know him. And he did a lot of the research on what's called uh, the Peruvian mummies. Uh, the one that he in particular researched was named Maria, and it's interesting, she has only three fingers, and they've done genetic research on her, and only about 70 to 80 percent of her genes are the same as humans. Now, this is connected with the Paracas culture and the Nazca lines, and the Paracas culture, some of them have the elongated skulls as well. Maria has an elongated skull. So it looks like there are some realities to that, uh, mm. that uh, the Peruvians have known for a long time. She goes back at least 700 years. Well, thank you, JJ and Desiree. Um, I also want to say there is an original writing by John Mack in this book I just wrote, I compiled called Making Contact, where you could see some of that thinking that's never before been published, also an essay by doctors uh, JJ and Desiree Hurtuck. But let me go back to you for uh, Elizabeth and ask you a question, then other people could jump in with questions or comments. Um, so the, the indigenous people are aware of these other beings and we are so stuck in a very limited point of view that we think is the more sophisticated one. And, uh, what do we have to give up here to really start to be making contact? This is something that uh, James O'Dee mentioned in the first thing. What do we need to let go of and give up to, to, to become really the people of the cosmos that we truly are? 
Probably our our self view as the pinnacle of evolution and uh, you know the brightest uh, bulb on the in the cosmos. Uh, <laughs> so if we had a little more humility, uh, <laughs> we we you know I uh, I remember years ago when uh, one of my dear friends, an MIT professor, was on a committee for designing a plaque to send out into space about humanity, and he asked me what. I thought should be put on it. And I said, I don't think you should send one out before we clean our house up. Well, he went back, he went back to the committee and told them that, and they all their, their jaws dropped, and then they went back to designing the plaque. Uh, mm. <laughs> anyway, humility would help a lot. And mm. uh, you know, we we have so much to learn from them. And if we're going to join a galactic family of nations, again, with Elizabeth's is saying to us is so important. There must be not only humility with our individual development, but we must be able to broadcast a sense of humility because we are living in very precarious times of having the mindset go into the technical phase where there's very little sensitivity and love. This whole area of love, unconditional compassion and greater understanding has to be broadcast. We cannot allow the media, which is more based upon what the Hollywood um, cosmic drama lead our young people into the future. That all of us have to step forward. This is mm -hmm. something we felt in Brazil with the indigenous and in Peru in particular. Right, and uh, the New York Times, in honor of the International Day of Peace, which was just last week, uh, the New York Times had come out with in the past a note that if you go back to 3,400 years of history and you study that as a planetary system, we've had about 270 years of peace on this planet. Yes. And you go back to the person, uh, Eshed, out of Israel, who said the aliens don't want us to be part of their network yet. And I think that's something that Elizabeth is well aware of as well. So, I mean, I get what you're saying. It's this lack of humility. It's this kind of aggressiveness and... Yeah, we need to do that. But um, let me ask Jude, because I love the sound of her voice and her speaking, but she's also coming from both those uh, levels of the science and the intuitive. So how do we attain this humility? I mean, we're so in it. We've destroyed our planet because of this lack of humility. And, and science is just as dogmatic as any of these um, Western conceptualists. So what do you think, Jude? Thanks, Elizabeth. That was Wonderful. Thank you so, so much, as always. Um, I think we can only heal it by healing our illusion of separation. You know, we've, we've had a collective worldview of separation that I talk about has driven a world of suffering and, and of ego and of, you know, the individual over the community and conflict. You know, in a sense, all our behaviours are natural outcomes if we have a worldview of separation. <laughs> if we have, as the indigenous uh, folks tell us, the ancient traditions tell us, Elizabeth, you know this so well, JJ Desiree, many of us know this so well, they all speak from a place of unity and diversity. They all speak from a, a perspective of a whole world. You know, and when we when we wake up to that, when we literally remember that, when we can actually find a way through to that remembering, then I feel it also brings humility. Hmm. It also brings gratitude. It all it also, you know, it also literally brings community, but community not just on a human level, but on a planetary level, on a cosmic level. Um, so that that's my Thank sense. And, and, and I also I'm really excited because Elizabeth and I have been, you know, speaking a lot and, and, you know, these different ways, these different sciences. I think when you talk about the Western science, it's dying. It's mm. old paradigm. The materialist separatism is dying. And I think it's actually beginning to grow up with all the evidence we're now getting to stand alongside the other sciences Mm. of Islam, of, of, of ancient traditions, of indigenous wisdom teachings. We're finding a convergence, and that convergence's homecoming is unity and diversity. And then I feel we can begin to mm. actually, you know, actually be open, as Jeff said right at the beginning, an openness 
of us to our extraterrestrial and our interterrestrial cosmic brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Beautiful, Jude. Um, uh, Jean and John have their hand up. I don't know which one has their hand up, but go ahead. Uh, yes, Jean. Jean. First of all, thank you, Ellen. Uh, Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, that was really powerful. Uh, as we say here in the South, we're singing out of the same hymn book uh, in Jude also. Um, John and I have done quite a lot of work with Beautiful Painted Arrow. Uh, some of you may know uh, Joseph, I don't know, Joseph Ryle. Uh, we spent many years working with him in the indigenous um, uh, culture, uh, which is some of my own heritage. And the, you asked the question, Alan, uh, what is it that we need to, you know, be hum humble, to go into humility? And the first thing that came to mind for me was the willingness of an individual. You can do it as a culture, but it makes it easy if you focus on the culture. It makes it easy not to focus on the individual responsibility. Uh, the individual responsibility of, and you've heard me say, many of you have heard me say this before, of keeping the hollow bone clear. Um, because that creates a vibrational field. And Elizabeth, I think you alluded to vibration. We, each time any one of us, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know, but each time any one of us makes a choice, we have gone and affected the, the actual resonant field of the entire species. And that's why any one of us uh, that is willing to be vulnerable, uh, to, to say what we feel like we need to say, to do what we need to do, to clear the hollow bone. Uh, whatever it is any one of us as an individual needs to do to create an experience of no separation, if it is within your family, no matter where it is, then, then just do it. Because what you then do is you feed into the mass resonant field and I, I keep coming back to the individual. We can have all kinds of global events. We can have, we can keep nurturing and inspiring the masses. And until it gets to the point where the individual's willing to take responsibility to keep themselves clear, uh, then we're not gonna be able to hear. Right. Uh, as you were leading us, Jeff, uh, through, I, I loved that meditation. It was wonderful. Um, but as, as each of us keeps ourselves clear, we're then able to hear. And that is affecting the entire uh, mass consciousness. Um, and there's more, but. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it, it seems to keep going back to getting back to our indigenous roots. Kurt, and and then you want to call on Mitchell to just spend some time with the Kogis. But go ahead, Kurt. Yes. Yeah, this is just a quickie because what I wanted to note is that one part of our science that is neutral is the, is the math. And it's amazing the generalities that are available to us from the mathematical understanding of processes outside of our stories. I just did a thing using three different statistical bases about the role of the guru. What's interesting about that would be that it would also be about any intervention of a higher vibration or a higher transmission. And data that's neutral data from punctuated equilibria, what's called genetic drift, but it's really statistical drift. And then also uh, uh, Poisson distributions, which you may know is what happens in up and down bell curves. You can end up predicting that 20 to 30% of awakenings to non-dual consciousness would have some kind of intervention involved that would involve some kind of transmission from a higher vibration. And it's interesting that simply because the math is the same, no matter the story you tell about it, the math comes out the same. And so that's at least one thing we got going for ourselves. And I think some of you know that when they've done these things that they sent out into space, They've done things that are based on mathematics, so people would have some idea, or else people, all beings, would have some idea of the commonality of process, irrespective of the kind of being that we are. Do you mean the math is the same no matter what science you're using? Because Elizabeth talked about different sciences. 
that what you mean? Uh, the, the math in statistics is the same no matter the things that you're talking about. Of course, there are parameters within models, but in the sense that the, the anal analogies you can draw from those are independent of the story that you're telling because they're how the process itself always works. Like it's not gonna matter what story you tell, but if you flip a coin a hundred times, you get 50% heads and 50% tails plus or minus about five. And that's just very, very basic. But those generalities, particularly in bell curves, when you understand uh, bell curves and then combinations of bell curves, what that predicts is independent of the history, the story, the time, anything else. Cause it's just built into the process, you know, that starts with just the basic statistics of yes and no, which comes out as 50, 50 plus or minus. And where does that get us then Kurt? Just where does that lead us? Well, what it does is that for instance, you know, I did this in response to a question about is the guru still valid in the modern world? And uh, because so many people are now saying that that reality of transmission or the role of the true guru, which I think actually you could, you could translate that to any kind of teacher who's intervening from a higher level and also using, utilizing transmission and answering the question, is transmission real? And the answer, of course, is yes. Right. That you would, you would have to expect just from the way process works across all of our statistic models that 20 to 30% of phenomena would have some kind of intervention um, from that from that other level, but it would go anyway. Well, thank you, thank. You. Let's keep our response about three minutes. I know a lot of people have to say have a lot to say, but Mitchell, you just spent time with the Kogis uh, right there in their home environment, and did was there any mention of extraterrestrial awareness on their part when you were there with them? Uh, no, there wasn't any. Uh, overt uh, discussion about that, Alan. Uh, but there was a very interesting, I would say, my subjective experience of being in their presence, which was also corroborated by other friends of mine that were there and associates. And uh, I don't think it's irrelevant to this conversation, even though it's coming in from a different uh, well, share angle. It share it. Yeah. And that is what I would describe as the relationship to time. There was this sense that you could only gather intuitively. And of course, it's including the sensory apparatus. But there was a sense that they were operating both in the present. So when they the spiritual elders looked at you, you saw them looking at you, but there was also a sense that they were looking beyond. And when they were speaking among themselves, uh, which we were always privy to, uh, they would have a conversation that had nothing to do with any of our time frames. It was as though it were existing in its own dimension. And granted, this is a subjective report, I understand. But we want to give proper credibility to our larger feeling sense. And that's what we were experiencing. Plus, would also, even though there was a lot happening locally, let's say with the watershed in this part of Ecuador, Vilcabamba, dealing with the Andes Mountains and what's happening to the water based on people polluting and trying to control and own and all of that, their view is planetary and they just want to see. In fact, it's funny, just before this gathering, I was on another call with a water, a global water blessing community in which the Kogi were being featured and they were baptizing the water on the planet as though to renew it with their consciousness. So even despite what we would call pollution and the, and the like, they are bringing a level of consciousness to the water to utterly renew it. So while they did not make reference in my dialogues with them to extraterrestrial life, there you could feel and what they say is totally cosmic in nature. They're recognizing the brotherhood and sisterhood of all beings everywhere. 
and there everywhere ain't just planet Earth. Right. Thank you, Mitchell. Well, we seem to have a lot of these different elements that people are putting out here today. I wonder if Jean Houston could pull some of these pieces together and integrate them into a, a kind of um, direction that we can follow in a sense. Jean, yes. What an opportunity, what a challenge, how impossible. <laughs> Right. Um, well, we know we have the changes. We have um, the the intuitive. We yeah. have the humility. So, yeah, it's the changing of the guard on the cosmic level, and we realize that we are not encapsulated bags of skin dragging around a dreary ego. That we are levels and levels and levels within ourselves, and what is activated are these levels. I live in a town. Ashland, Oregon, in which a surprising number of the members of the town have direct experiences um, with the, they talk about the Pleiadians, etc. And these experiences are healing experiences. <clears throat> in the several cases that I know a lot of, they are people who have things that are deeply physically wrong, and they have. Um, one is, was someone who was, from the age of four, she lived in the middle of uh, um, a desert state. And she would go to a special stone and they would come and take her on little trips, except that it evidently resulted in uh, various forms of physical disabilities later in life. And they feel guilty, so she says, so they show up regularly. <laughs> and do these regular healings and very, very, you know, existentially real kinds of situations. Another is a, a very great uh, comedy writer and she has regular uh, access and they also are helping her with her physical issues. So we have both the hands-on sensory rich, um, contacts and then you have the philosophical shifts and the philosophical shifts all seem to be based on the same metier which is you're killing the earth right and we as members of perhaps i'm not saying a galactic milieu but perhaps they are are here to help you stop that mm -hmm. but we cannot interfere physically that's one thing that is made over and over again. There, there are certain laws about this. We can inspire, we can evoke, we can help locally, but it is up to you. Now, run that parallel with the new uh, explorations in, in um, quantum physics, where everything is interrelated with everything else. And I think that one would have to go into a kind of profound meditation of the both the the everythingness that we are part of the same continuum of being and join that with a different sense of time it was interesting that time came up the time as we know is not past present and future it is simultaneous and much much more mm -hmm. so when you and that we are cosmic beings dressed in a local space time biodegradable space time suit <laughs> right, and right. that's not simply true for us but for the whole fabric of life in the universe. So I think that some of these members who are suggesting that maybe our time of troubles, and we're in one of the worst time of troubles in the history of humanity, is also the wake up call from central, so to speak. Mm -hmm. However central manifests, whether as in interplanetary beings or the mind and spirit of God or whatever you call it. We're being called back into a great unity. And this great unity requires of us an appropriate response, showing that at least we are trying, you know, with regard to our planet. And that's why you find, I find that among my friends, it is particularly the ones who really are trying with regard to the saving of the earth, who are making, if not contact with extraterrestrial beings, 
then definitely contact with the great unified beingness, whether you call it God or the great oneness that is the ultimate incarnation for us all. <clears throat> Thank you, Jean. It seems like what everyone's sort of suggesting is the transcendent experience, the transcendent self, the one that's beyond the ego mind. This is where if we're going to meet the cosmic others, as JJ and Desiree talk about and Elizabeth, we have to go beyond some limited portion of our humanity. And there have been people who have done that. I mean, maybe uh, Susan, mm -hmm. if you care to speak about some of your contact, because I, if you want to share anything and the states of consciousness that you've experienced, possibly, if you care to share that. Uh, sure, I'll try to do a segue. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, by the way, it's great hearing everybody speak. So thank you so much for that. Um, I, I spent um, this last week with actually a, uh, a woman who is a Blackfoot elder um, in Montana. And I guess one of the things that I, I can say is um, that they also need our stories. So those of us who have um, this contact. Um, they need our, our stories as well. Um, we, one of the, the things that I heard, um, God, I hope this is not going to be public because I'd like to, if you can edit this part out. It is going to be public. Out. So, I mean, yeah. it is part of a public forum. All right. All right. Well, let me see what I can say about that. Cause I'd like okay. to maintain confidentiality. Um, okay. that the interchange is really important in, in that, um, story exchange because those of us who have had contact and you know just for everybody here i um mm -hmm. I've had contact ever since i can remember and knew that i made a conscious choice to come to this planet um because i was on a, a you know call it a rescue mission i knew that the the humanity um was in trouble and um there's a lot more to that but one of the things that i can say is this has evolved over time um, one of the things that I always knew when I was little is that when we were able to um, commune and connect with these beings um, on a more gentle, subtle, uh, clear, clean vibration, that it would mean that we're nearing that time. And I believe that we are nearing that time right now. So. Um, you see that there's lots of people that are seeing ships in the sky. A gentleman picked me up last night um, and was showing me some incredible pictures and he's a young guy. And um, you know, the reason why I'm sharing this piece is we're at that pushing point of this critical <laughs> nature on planet earth. Uh, yes, we've done a lot to this planet ourselves. And yet, you know, the earth has our own mechanisms of how she's going to respond um, to these changes that are going on um, mm -hmm. in the solar system and in the galaxy and also in the universe as a whole. So, um, you know, there's a lot that's at play, but, you know, maybe to your point, Alan, to speak about that, you know, it, 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 it's an evolving process and it has been an evolving process. And um, if I was to sum up and say, you know, what is contact about? You know, to me, it's about the connection of sentient life force in mm -hmm. everything, um, in the plant kingdom, in the animal kingdom, in the ether, um, and the story about, you know, the Kogi that was told about, you know, shifting the water and shifting the consciousness. That's very real. And that's definitely something that's two o'clock seeing more and more um, that, you know, we, we are, um, I would say co-creators of our reality, as long as it's in alignment and harmony with um, you know, the natural frequencies of the earth. So again, there, there's so much to share and say on this, but it's getting closer and closer and closer. And I was uh, at dinner last night with another individual who has contact, um, you know, quite significant as well. And um, he said the same thing. So there seems to be this, this coming together and this almost um, close uh, merging of, of us here with these beings in these ships. So, you know, more to come because it's an evolving process. 
Well, it is exciting and it's also very dangerous times we're treading on because this is a crisis time that we're in. And it seems what everyone is saying, we have to shift the way we think about ourselves, the world, our sciences, and um, make room for, for more possibilities. We, we've been so limited in the West. Um, does anyone want to comment on that or throw out some of their um, own ideas? Well, I can oh, share Mitchell, let me, bit, Alan. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, Diane, and then James, and then, okay, yeah, Diane. I think then, a lot yeah. depends on how welcoming we are. Um, and open to the fact that we're not the only intelligence in the universe and open to having an experience. Because I remember when I was on a, a trip with uh, Greg Braden and a group of others, and we were talking about some of these issues. And then the people there were just, the indigenous people were like, well, just ask for you know, contact. And so we did, we sat up, we were on the roof outside somebody's, there's about 14 of us outside somebody's uh, hotel. And we saw ships go right into Lake Titicaca. I mean, clear as anything. Mm -hmm. So I think because we had that openness, we had that experience. And also I remember another time I was in Venezuela in the Grand Sabana and uh, we were staying at this guest house and there was a picture of, it was a painting of ETs on the wall. And we asked the indigenous people, you know, tell us the story behind this painting. And they said, well, those are our friends. You know, they come to visit us all the time. It was just very natural. They said they even helped us, our plane go when the plane was broke. Um, so this sense of openness, belief, welcoming, I think is really the key to having these experiences. And once we have the experiences, we have more confidence to be able to share um, them with others. And I think others start to have experiences as well. Exactly. We, we have to change this worldview that John Mack talked about, that Elizabeth mentioned this, this and, and be open to the fact that we're part of something bigger and, and we haven't learned that. Let me get to James O.D. because I always appreciate your contributions, James. Yeah, thank you. I just want to make a naked appeal for the power of love in the cosmos and that love is speaking to us. Love is communicating and we can get a little lost in what I would call the Protestant perspective of shame and regret and failure and all that we are not, as Jean in her life has so eloquently taught us, we are drawn by the lure of being and becoming. And our task is to reflect the magnificence of our being and becoming and draw humanity away from the cliff's edge. But if it gets too terrible, we'll get lost. And a footnote on the Kogi, who I have spent time with and who have come here to Crestone and visited with, in their cosmology, there are 16 dimensions. Hmm. So there, when they connect and communicate, <laughs> they are really traveling in those dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I hope it's not too raw just to plant the flag of love that yeah. self-communicative love in the universe and the beings who are communicating with us more and more have so much compassion for our fumbling, wounded way of growing. Thank you, James. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> 
it re, what you said reminds me of one of my favorite lines from John Mack, who said, UFOs are like an outreach program from the universe for the consciously impaired. That's us. <laughs> You're the conscious. So we, we do, uh, love is the answer. Um, <clears throat> wait, Mitch, I'll, I'll go to you, but let, but let me ask Darcy and Robin, because they've, uh, they've shared, if they, if they want to jump in with some experiences and, and um, or some comments, uh, if you care to or not, um, please join us. Thank you so much, Alan, and thank you, Elizabeth and Jean. Uh, I just felt like jumping in because it, there was a, a thread of synchronicity. Um, Darcy and I were leading a group in uh, the Andes of Peru when the COVID military lockdown happened. And the day before we were at Sacsayhuaman in Kenko with Puma and his beautiful family and our daughter was playing with his son. and. It was just a, a moment of, um, you know, of recognizing how these golden threads weave through. And I, as students of the Andean wisdom traditions, as well as having beautiful mentors, um, both indigenous and, you know, of the rainbow tribe in North America, you know, one of the, to me, the, the underlying theme of love, but also the recognition of our, um, of how that state of consciousness and that vibratory experience of what we are actually emanating then allows for these beings who, one of our, our elders, who's a seek, seek black feet, he says, you know, the star beings are really shy. And so because they're so shy and they're totally a part of creation that we have to be really masterful with our, our vibration and our energy and so bringing through that love, bringing through that vibration, and then recognizing that the indigenous wisdom traditions, uh, because they're based in shamanism, that there's always a way of entering into the expanded state of consciousness. And to me, there's um, a, you know, there's a profound and undeniable call, especially within, you know, well, all generations and, and being like a, a old millennial here <laughs> that, you know, that there's this self-initiating aspect that's happening, especially with the teacher plants and the work with psychedelics, the work with consciousness expanding uh, plants and techniques. And that to me is something that then naturally we stumble into our magnificence. We have a uh, divine grace come through in these self-initiating experiences that then help to wake us up and kind of quicken and, and catalyze us. Um, and I'm sure we all have had experiences like that. And, uh, you know, the, the gift of the indigenous who are who, those who feel called to share so freely, such as you know, some of the Andean wisdom keepers and the Kogi and the black, some of the Seek Seek Blackfeet and the list goes on, that it's helping us to remember the uh, earth honoring animistic wisdom that's alive within all of our bloodlines, within all of our ancestry, and to reclaim that, that ceremony is necessary in order to anchor the vibrations and the activations that are happening on the planet and also to help to stabilize the field because we have such a strong field impact with our consciousness that just having a small amount of initiated people regardless of age or gender or anything else that can stabilize the field has radically exponential uh, impact and it's all through love and our children know it you know, and, and our innocence knows it. And yet it's this, it feels like we need so much help to retrain and deprogram. And to me, the, the ceremonies and especially the ceremonies of the Andes, uh, that they're so freely shared and also they're so, they're so relevant. Uh, and the plant spirit medicines, uh, when, when appropriately worked with and in this reverence, uh, seem to be radically activating an entire wave of star seeds and we are finding more more and more people who've already had contact and are just like near-death experiences trying to 
integrate back into their human experience what they just kind of were popped into. Uh, so just wanting to share all of that. And uh, Don Oscar has so much to share about this as well. And his, um, his guidance has been really uh, transformational in our lives around contact. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Desiree, did you just want to jump in there quickly? Because there's some other people that want to, but yeah. Right. Well, I just wanted to go on with what she had said. I think it's, we're really coming to a time of a great awakening. Many people have said this before. And also finding our own abilities because we are telepathic. We are able to communicate and we're able to start communicating with those levels of intelligence that are coming here now that are extraterrestrial and what, as you know, Alan, we call ultra terrestrial, the cosmic dimensions, and all these layers or dimensions are really starting to overlap. So it's amazing because we are really are at a key time that we've all incarnated for. As our late uh, friend astronaut, uh, Gordon Cooper said, this is the time of a great leap of faith, but we must seek the highest levels possible and not get connected with categories of intelligence that uh, may not understand the full spectrum of the awakening the inner contact experience, as you point out, Alan, is just as important as the outer. We must seek this greater love and this greater harmony within ourselves. If we are to reach what the ancient prophets and wisdom keepers call the avatars, the Elohim, B'nai Elohim, all that really does exist. And we've experienced this in a variety of culture traditions. But now is the time of the homecoming. The, the gathering of the tribes of humanity is really at stake. And we must be the beacons of light with this great leap of faith and experience. Well, that's why I'm so happy we're having these conversations and that's why I think it's important they become public so people can get glimpses of directions or um, self-reflection. Um, Barbara, do you wanna say anything? Barbara Layton, I mean, you always have something to add. No, that's okay. Um, does, um, let me just see, we, Elizabeth, I'm going to go back to you for a little bit to see, like, what, what have you gotten from some of these comments and how does this integrate into a bigger, bigger understanding of where we're at and where we can go from your perspective? Well, I'm, I'm really happy with the number of people who have brought up Indigenous wisdom, uh, because so many of those Wait, you muted. Wait, don't I want? Wait, you muted yourself. I don't want to miss that. I'm Unmute. sorry. <laughs> okay. I'm I'm really happy at how many people <laughs> uh, spoke to the indigenous wisdom that we have to draw on uh, for those indigenous cultures that did reach maturity, and of course now what's new about now is that it's the first time that we've had to get all this community stuff cooperation stuff at the global level. We've never had to do it as a whole planet before. That's what's new. And uh, you know, the we didn't even touch on the hybrid program, but right. um, for instance, Paula Underwood, one of the people who was at that original disclosure conference, I didn't know it at the time. I've I knew Paula for a long time. We were close friends before she finally admitted that she was part of that program, that she willingly donated her eggs, that her mom had done it before her. And, uh, and John Mack, I think, referred to it as a, as a kind of uh, maybe iffy lifeboat project where they're trying to hold on to some of our genes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in case in case we really wreck it in case we really blow it here that at least that our genes will be on record for other people to do things with um so that's that's another interesting aspect i've known of course many direct experiencers and i've never known one that had a bad experience it was always positive and it was always this is a warning stop what you're doing people we have to wake up we have to get together and not let ourselves be manipulated into a transhumanist, artificial intelligence, robot society of obedience and, and you know, draw on our own incredible individual keyboard that we're all matter, energy, spirit. We're not bodies with souls and with minds. Uh, we're the whole thing. 
and it's unique. It's a great privilege in the cosmos, and we've got to get this right. We mm. have to stand up. We are the evolutionary leaders, and we have to, uh, you know, make sure that we don't only preach love and spirituality, but that we act on the ground with what's going on around us to make sure that we're building this butterfly world together and being strong together. Right. Well, you know, I do have to admit that it can be a little traumatic to have some of these experiences. And I think the earth is sort of going through that because when you encounter something so far out of the existing paradigm, the human consciousness doesn't know what to do with it unless you've been prepared as an indigenous person that can speak to lots of beings. This is why I think the government has not come forward because they don't understand it because they're looking at it through a very narrow lens and they feel too many people will go into fear because we don't have the training of 16 dimensions. We need that. We need that math, that, that science, that expansion in order to meet the others outside our very limited mind controlled ego sense of reality. So it may not be a negative experience, but we have to expand into the unknown. That's, that's, so that's what I'm writing about and that's what I feel. Um, we're here to help lead the way out of the known into the unknown because that's, that's where the future lies. Um, does, um, Mitchell Jean, has his you, hand up. Um, who does, oh, Mitchell, did you want to comment on that? Or he had his hand up before, yeah. A little before that, I, although I completely agree with you, Alan, you and I have been foraging and foraying into the unknown for a <laughs> and long foraging time. foraging too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, on, on, we we're talking about so many different layers of subjects here. Yeah. It's really very titillating, quite honestly. And uh, one underlying piece is something that we have the, the madam here for, and that's the whole space of human potential. And that human potential of course, I'm talking about Gene Houston, um, is what is our cosmic identity. I mean, I think that kind of underlies a lot of the work you're doing, Alan, and have been doing so long for uh, to bring this to our attention, that that's really going to be our next human step. It's just kind of interesting in listening to Elizabeth, too, and dialogues that she and I have been having for the past some months um, offline, so to speak, of when humanity gets to its lowest ebb, it appears that help is on the way. And I feel rather comfortable in saying, I feel that we are approaching our lowest ebb between <laughs> what's happening with the world of nuclear, with the onset of new kinds of playing around with new wars, with what's happening with North Korea, what's happening with the entire conversation around COVID that is dividing families, brothers and sisters like we've never seen before. When you add all of this up, human beings are a mess as a whole. And thankfully, there are groups like ours here um, that are seeking. And God knows, according to Paul Hawken in his book, Blessed Unrest, there are millions of people everywhere that think along similar lines as we do. And it's really only a select few that are seeking to write the story. And that just brings back to the last point that I'll make, Alan, which is I do think, and Mike said this during our several panels, UFO panels some months back, um, is that I think it's important for us to, as much as we can, control the narrative about the UFO experience. And that's part of what we're doing here. And I think all of us in our own respective lives are doing a lot to do that so that it's got a benevolent quality. And while we don't know the truth of what's what, um, we may as well approach it sort of like the way, you know, Einstein posits the question, is the universe friendly? Well, I'm gonna say yes. Well, thank you, Mitchell. I do, I'm glad you came back to your seat, Gene, because I wanted to 
ask you about that human potential, cosmic potential, whatever else you want to add as we sort of wrap up. So unmute yourself, Jean, and you'll get me and my dog unmuted, unfortunately, because she's <laughs> that's okay. She decided to sing today. <laughs> we have some other intelligences in the well, room. Well, you know, the, the fact is that when you look at the psychology of history and historical epochs, you find over and over again that times of great breakdown, whole system transition at its in going in the negative ways, um, including pandemics, precede times of renaissance. I love the Italian word, rinascita, <laughs> rebirth, regeneration. And many of us feel that we are in one of those extraordinary times of breakdown that precedes the breakthrough. Many of you here are guides to the breakthrough and have spent your lives looking at the dynamics of what it takes to really go beyond the time of mental and spiritual crisis and move into the next stage. My old friend, Elizabeth, certainly has been a leader in this for, well, all your life, Elizabeth. That's why you're so interesting, because I always know you're there with the next stage, you know. Um, I think that we are, I, I look at the times that produced Bach and um, Shakespeare, and they were tremendous times of troubles. And something about, let's say, the music of Bach, which is a, it's a turning of the page of the nature of the mind to have produced what is our human equivalent of your 16 dimensions, you know. I, I look at uh, Shakespeare, who essentially invented the English language. It was said that, you know, the Bible uses 11,000 words, Shakespeare uses 25,000, which proves that Shakespeare was smarter than God. <laughs> but you always have this time of breakthrough. And I know that in our midst here, and our people who are agents of the new inner cosmology, that you are, maybe all of you are intronauts. Many, all of you are intronauts, but you have to take yourself seriously. And it's not about writing a new paper or God help us, <laughs> as I'm doing now with Anna Luz, this, uh, you know, looking at the cosmic human, the new, the new human, but it is, it is a, uh, it's an opportunity. I'm going to suggest that we have a meeting which is opportunist and knowing that you, you, you don't go around mealy mouth and squeamish, but you have to admit your own genius. That is a whole different state of art and a state of being. That's where you know that the human heart can go to the lengths of God and dark and cold we may be, but this is no winter now. As the poet says, the frozen misery of centuries, cracks, breaks, begins to move. The thunder is the thunder of the flood, the flow, the upstart spring. Thank God our time is now when wrong comes up to meet us everywhere, never to leave us till we take the longest stride of soul folk ever took. Affairs are now soul-sized. The enterprise is exploration into God. So friends, what are we making for? It takes so many thousand years to wake, but shall we wake for pity's sake? And of course we have to. You are the ones who are, have been emboldened or condemned, however you want to see it, to be the awakeners. And it means that we really need a renewed sense of who and what we truly, truly, truly are. We're the people of the, the end of one era, filled with its, its epidemics and its horrors. And we are also the initiators of the next. This is not pride or foolishness. This is uh, human wizardry, which is always been there within us waiting, waiting to come into its fullness. It's the time of fullness. I think our next meeting has got to be the evocation and the quickening of who and what you really, really, really are. And then you will know your path. We will know our future, which is already 
perspective, time, past, present, future are simultaneous. That future is coming at us, it cascades of not enlightenment, but of a kind of merriment. Yes, these are the times we are the people. Let's do something about it. We have the invitation from the cosmos. Let's take it and go to the great party. Mm. I think that sort of said it. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. Beautiful. Um, anything, I, maybe there's nothing to add to that because how could there be? But Elizabeth, do you want to say anything <laughs> um, before we sign off? <laughs> I think Jean did a great job of moving us to the next meeting. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. And That's true. Anybody Thank else have maybe. a... Thank you. Anybody else? Ron, did you have something you were going to say or any anything to add in there? Or, thank you. Anything from anyone? Diane or Ron, were you going to say something? No. Yes. Unmute. Unmute. Go ahead. Unmute and then we'll wrap it up here if you can. Yes. Ron Friedman. It's, it's fantastic, the springboard that we all are right here, right now. Uh, it's a privilege to be here with all of you and the knowing that the very fact that we are together here and non-local, non-local, that is so important to remember because that memory is a very dynamic force in everything that we do every day. I think that is the gift, that is the communication that has to be picked up by the frequency of the great intelligence that is waiting for our input and our creativity. Mm. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. This is why we gather so the genius can be born through our dialogue and through each one of us. Thank you. Beautiful, Ron. Thanks. Um, Diane, anything you want to say Just before we close? Thank you so much, Elizabeth, our special guest, for inspiring such an amazing conversation. Uh, Jeff, for grounding us with your beautiful meditation. Alan, your amazing uh, facilitation as always. And everybody that contributed um, such beautiful remarks. Jean, for giving us the topic for our next call, <laughs> Invocation and the Quickening of Who We Are. Maybe, Jean, you can, you can be our special guest for the next call. Yes. Um, we would love that. And um, we have to decide because the next call would be Wednesday, November 24th, which is the day before Thanksgiving. Um, mm -hmm. Do we feel like we want to have a call that day or do we want to wait till December? What um, are people feeling? Well, what, well, could we I'm move okay. it before? What if we move it the week before? Yeah. Okay, let's look at that date and then see. I'm just going to quickly look at my calendar. 17th, November 17th. Uh, yep, that's that's good for me. Is that good for everybody? Yeah, right. And you no, know, I'm sorry, Diane. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to ask if Jean would be available to say a couple words on that call, sure. and maybe just inspire the dialogue on evocation and the quickening of who we are. Great, because I'd be honored. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Jean. Okay, thank you. Diane. This is such a beautiful exploration together into the unknown. Eve, you were going to say something? I just wanted to, because John, who spoke so eloquently, uh, well, everyone has, but mm -hmm. you emphasized the non-local and it, I thought, um, yeah, I'm with you on that as, as we all are, um, but it might be fun for us to just say, go right through the little squares and say where we're beaming in from, just to give us a sense of how much we are, at least on the planet, bringing our energy into a collective field. Does, if that interests anybody, I think. Yeah. We yeah. can do that. Um, yeah. we, are we all in the same position squares? Where are you, JJ and Desiree? We're in Switzerland. Oh, 
I'm in Wacabuck, New York. <laughs> Dar Darcy, <laughs> Darcy and Robin. Nelson, yeah. British Columbia. And Jeff. Beal, England. And Jean. Ashland, Oregon. And Elizabeth. Honolulu. And, and Max and Joan. Hi, Joan. Hi, we're in Montana. Hi, Alan. Hi, everybody. I'm good to see so many good friends. Joan has some great experiences to share. Maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> and, um, uh, Diane, where are you? I'm in Leiden, the Netherlands. And, and Eve? I'm in on Spetses in Greece. Oh. And Jean and John. Single Mountain, Tennessee. And Bob, good to see you. Where you? Maine. Maine. Wow. And Victoria. Stanford, Connecticut on a ball in space. <laughs> <laughs> and Anna Louise. Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. Mauritius, Mauritius in the Indian yes, Ocean? Really? I guess you win the prize for the most <laughs> <laughs> and and Barbara, where are you? Wait, unmute. We want to hear where you are. Un unmute Barbara. Un Not Bern far from you, Alan, East Hampton, New York. Okay. And Bernice. Boulder, Colorado. And Ron. Sanford, Connecticut. Olivia. Denver. Colorado. Uh, Emmanuel. Mad Madrid, Spain. Oh, nice. And Kurt. Wonderful, boring New York. <laughs> and, and Nancy Roof, if you want to share. Berkshires, Massachusetts. And there we are, non local in our uh, reality. Right. <laughs> thank you thank you elizabeth and everyone. thanks jj desiree diane jean everyone <laughs> it's inspiring jean i was, well, was brought to tears with that you know proclamation of our destiny so that was worth it it's all worth it to share this exploration because we are so close to something unknown approaching our psyche that we need these conversations to wake up to who we really are because we're, we're not these little squares, we're bigger. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks everybody, thanks Diane. And we'll, we're gonna post this live, um, I mean this, this thing on, on YouTube and we could send the link to that too, so. So next call, October okay. 17th at 1 p.m. Eastern. This Yes. Works for everybody. Thank you. Good. Next time. Yeah, thanks everyone. Love you all. Bye, everybody. Love you all. We'll be together. Bye. Thank you, Thank you, Bye. Thank you, Thank you Elizabeth. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and Diane. Everybody. Cha cha. And um, Joan and Max. Oh, oh, hi. If you would like to receive notices Hi. about future calls, um, maybe just pop your email in the chat now, just so I could send you an invitation. Okay. Let's see.